Good morning. Most blessed Easter to each and every one of you as today we focus our attention on the victory that Christ Jesus gives to us because Christ Jesus is risen and we worship him in spirit and truth and rejoice at that victory that he gives to us. We will follow the service as printed for you in your service folder and we will start with our first hymn, hymn 157. Please stand. Once again, we turn back to our worship folder as we begin this Easter resurrection celebration victorious in Jesus. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends in Christ, today we come together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord. Let us draw near to him in worship and in praise, in our thoughts and in our prayers. Alleluia, Christ is risen. 
Upon the hill the cross now stands empty. Morning light breaks upon the tomb. As we come before our God and King, let us confess our sins. Lord God, I humbly come before you. I confess that I am sinful in thought, word, and deed. I daily fail to do what you command and continually do what you forbid. Lord, I am sorry for my sins. I believe that for the sake of my Lord Jesus Christ, you will have mercy on me. Upon this, your sincere confession, by Christ's command and authority, I assure you that all your sins are forgiven. The vacant cross and the empty grave are God's signs to you that he has accepted the sacrifice of his one and only Son. Whoever believes this simple truth of Scripture has eternal life. The Lord is gracious and righteous. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. You may be seated as we sing our next hymn. This is the Feast of Victory.
We pray. Lord God, you made the dawn of this most holy day shine with the glory of our Lord's resurrection. Grant that we who have been raised from the death of sin by your life-giving spirit may worship you in sincerity and truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson, a word from the Old Testament book, Isaiah chapter 12. In that day you will say, I will give thanks to you, Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you comfort me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust him and will not be afraid. Because Yah, the Lord, is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day, you will say, give thanks to the Lord, proclaim his name. Declare among the peoples what he has done. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done amazing things. Let this be known in all the earth. Shout aloud and sing for joy, daughter of Zion, for the Holy One of Israel is great among you. This is the word of our God. We turn in, the, in your service folder to Psalm 118. Please follow the instructions as printed.
Our second lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, that great resurrection chapter, 51 through 57. Look, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the blink of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishability, and this mortal body must put on immortality. But once this perishable body has put on imperishability and this mortal body has put on immortality, then what is written will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. This is God's word. Our choir responds with Christ Jesus lay in death's strong bands.
Please stand out of respect for our gospel, the words and works of Jesus. As printed in your service folder, John's gospel this morning, taken from chapter 20, we read verses 1 through 18. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. She saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she left and ran to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, she told them, and we don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple went out, headed for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Bending over, he saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was following him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there. The cloth that had been on Jesus' head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. Then the other disciple who arrived at the tomb first also entered. He saw and believed. They still did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the, facing the tomb, weeping. As she wept, she bent over, looking into the tomb. She saw two angels in white clothes sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and one at the feet. They asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? She told them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I don't know where they have laid him. After she said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, though she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Supposing he was the gardener, she replied, Sir, if you've carried him off, tell me where you laid him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and replied in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus told her, Do not continue to cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. She also told them the things he said to her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Please be seated. We'll open up to hymn 152 and sing the verses as directed in your service folder.
Oh, what sweet joy that sentence gives. I know, I know my Redeemer lives. He is risen. risen Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. If you were to ask a Sunday school student or a little child who really knows Jesus to give a simple answer, what did Jesus do to save you? You probably wouldn't be surprised to hear an answer like this. Well, Jesus died to take away my sins. It's a good answer, isn't it? And in so doing, that child would be giving you an answer that actually is biblical. In fact, that's what Dr. Luke, inspired writer of Acts, today tells us prior to our text, he was delivered over to death for our sins. Here's the thing. Children get Good Friday. They understand Jesus died. Adults understand Jesus died to take away our sins, yes. So we're good on that Good Friday hill. We understand the cross. We understand Jesus died. But sometimes we forget to go over to the empty tomb. Sometimes we forget that A huge part of our salvation and victory over sin and death is the fact that the tomb did not keep and hold Jesus in it, but he wasn't there, just as he said. Now, don't get me wrong. We we know it. In fact, we confess it in the Apostles' Creed. He rose on the third day. But this morning when you came in, some of you, I know, heard this greeting. You didn't hear me say, oh, what a beautiful morning, and then you responded with, oh, what a beautiful day. It was, it is, but that's not what we rejoice in today. You said it right away at the beginning. Instead, we said, Christ is risen, and you said, because he is. That's what we have as reason to rejoice today. That is our reason. Christ has left the tomb empty for us, and As Paul says in our text for today, he was raised to life, Jesus. And isn't that what we say? Jesus rose from the dead on the third day. He came back to life and he showed us his victory over death. But then why does it say Jesus was raised? That's not a past tense, that's a passive tense. In other words, it, what, something was done to him to bring him back to life. He was acted upon, if you will. He was passive in receiving that life. So does that mean that Jesus didn't come back to life on his own? Does that mean he's not the Son of God and he doesn't have the power over death? No. In fact, he actually would say that earlier in his ministry to people as they were standing around the temple and they thought that, well, this church and this magnificent temple is going to last forever and Jesus says, no, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. We're not surprised because that's what we confess. That's what the scriptures tell us. That's what God tells us in his word. Jesus rose from the dead. He actually showed that power over death. You remember, don't you? This was the same week when Jesus went to the house and his friend Lazarus was already dead four days. It was the fourth day and, well, you know what happens. And lo and behold, Lazarus come out, and he did. He showed his power over death, and he did that with the daughter of Jairus and the boy at Nain. He shows the power over death. So then why? Why does Peter then, earlier on in Acts, say in that sermon to the people, God raised him from the dead? Why does Paul in our Second lesson for today from 1 Corinthians 15, that resurrection chapter. Paul says, we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And in our text for today, too, he was raised to life for our justification. Why does the Bible talk about Jesus as being raised almost by someone else being the Father? I'm going to let you wrestle with that for a little bit because there's another word that comes up. And it's the word that we often use in in our Lutheran circles 
Uh, we, like, we like fancy words, we like complicated words, and we like them because, because in one word you can say a huge doctrinal concept. And if you don't know what some of these words mean, I'm going to put that on you to go and find out what that is, because I guarantee you in your confirmation or catechism, you'll find these words and what they mean. But you know what kind of words I'm talking about, don't you? We talk about disciple or discipline. You hear the word disciple in there. Discipline is also supposed to meant to teach. We talk about things like being, Jesus being a prophet, a priest, and a king. And, and if you remember from catechism, Jesus fills those roles in different ways. We talk about Jesus being holy and righteous. I think we kind of understand what holy is, maybe, kind of, sort of. Righteous, kind of, sort of. And then the Bible uses those Asian words. There's sanctification, and then, of course, our word for today, that you really can't celebrate and you can't find joy in Easter without justification. Now, what's that word mean? Well, what that word is, is kind of a, it's a, again, it packs all this information into one word. And what is that information? Well, to kind of help you understand what that word means, think of it this way. Some have said justification is just as if I never sin. Actually, it's a courtroom term. Um, more or less, it is to be declared not guilty. We talk about justifying ourselves in our day-to-day -day lives. Maybe you did something um, against, or it was perceived that you did something against a friend or a spouse or, or a parent or, or someone you know. And you seek to justify your actions because they don't quite understand what you did. And, and what do you do when you do that? Well, you speak to them and you try to explain so that you can bring them around to see things from your perspective so that they don't think so, so ill of you. And usually when you justify yourself towards someone else, it doesn't really matter who's there hearing it as long as that one person that matters to you thinks that you're justified, you're innocent, you're declared not guilty in your actions. Does that sound about right to you? The way that you and I justify ourselves? So that it really only matters if it's my friend or my my spouse or my child or my insert that person that matters to you here's the thing though we can we can emotionally argue someone into believing us and believing that we are justified in our actions sometimes sadly it's being a lawyer for sin telling others well i'm not wrong in this because everyone else is doing it and so it can't be that bad and so we might be able to convince people around us who know us, and here, here's the problem. That's not going to mean anything when we step into God's court. Because that's really what we're going to do on the last day. We're going to stand before God, and we can have family and friends all we want to to try to, try to get their testimonials behind us. And, you know, sometimes people do that at funerals. I find it interesting that people don't ask what the person's faith was, if they trusted in Jesus or not. Instead, they just talk about how good the person was in their life. They're all biased. Every one of our family and friends is biased because we've convinced them this is how, and this is how good we are and this is really what we think that God should see in us. Reality check. You're standing in God's courtroom. You can't hide anything from him. You can't hide your thoughts. You can't hide your motives. You can't hide your emotions. You can't hide your actions. You can't hide those things that you hide from the pastor and other Christians because you hope that they don't know it so you can keep indulging those things. God sees them all. And as you stand before God the judge, whether your sin in your mind is major or minor, we like to parse those things out too. God still says, in order to enter into my eternity, you have to be absolutely perfect in every way. Thought, word, and action. And if you're not, then here's your sentence. Death. Capital punishment. 
not just a lethal injection from this world, but it is a sentence, an eternal sentence in hell for sin. And you can rally your friends together behind you. You can go back to their testimony. You can go back to the jury even. You can go to all the people that know you and say, but look at what I've done. That's got to stand for something. You know, I'm a good person. But in the end, they don't decide, do they? You and I will stand before God and have to give testimony, witness, for our lives. Even more, who we trust in for eternal life. In comes Jesus. Who is he? Well, he's a guy that we just finished talking about this whole Lenten season who we know is true God and true man, who went through everything that God demanded from you and me. And what God said to you is, be holy because that's what I am. In order for you to enter into my kingdom, you need to be perfect in every way. And Jesus says, yep, done. And then God says, yeah, but uh, there are all these crimes that are committed against God, sins. And Jesus turns around and he looks at you and me, and he says, and then he turns back around and looks at his father, who is the judge, and he says, it is finished. I paid for that too. So what Jesus does is he comes into your courtroom at the end of your life, and he covers over your sins. And in place of your sins, he gives his own, here's the word again, righteousness, his own holiness, his own rightness before God in place of our wrongness. And then as God meets out the sentence, he says, all right, I'll accept that. Now let's go back to what I said earlier about Jesus being raised from the dead. Remember, Paul said, or excuse me, Luke said this, he was raised to life for our justification. Why does that come into play right now when God is about to say, here's the sentence. Because he's using Jesus, his perfection, his payment, to give you the sentence. And when he says Christ was raised to life, really what that means is, it's not that the Father didn't know Jesus finished it. It's not that the Father didn't know that Jesus rose from the dead, unbeknownst to anyone, because no one saw him rise. They saw him after he rose. So God actually says these words, so you and I know, and here it is, that God accepted Jesus' payment. That God accepted Jesus as the perfect substitute. That God accepted Jesus as the perfect payment and the enough, it is finished, to take all of our sins away so that the God of the court of heaven can turn to you and me and say, you're free. You're free to live in God's grace. You're free to now serve him, and you're free to go. You're free to now enter eternity that I've prepared for you through Jesus. Jesus finished it. He's the one who claimed the victory. And here's the thing. You and I could look at Jesus, as many religions do, and say, wow, what a great guy. He finished everything. He completed the test. He got 100%. Good job. He wants us to follow in his shoes. He wants us to walk in his steps. No, we can't. Jesus did it instead of us. He was the substitute payment. He's the substitute lamb, perfect in every way. He's the one who gives his life. And pay attention to one word. He was raised to life for our justification. Not his, but ours. That means everything in the world and outside of the world for you and me. Because when we see Jesus do all of this for us, then we say things like, yeah, Easter isn't about the baskets and the bunnies. It's not about the candy and the eggs. It's not even about the family gatherings or going to church one time out of the year. No. 
It's about Jesus. But Jesus actually makes it all about you. There's another saying we do at Christmas time, right? Jesus is the reason for the season. You hear that too around this time of the year. Yes, Jesus is the reason for the season, but Jesus makes this season all about your justification. There I use the word. Figured out what it means. Jesus makes this about you knowing without a doubt all the faults, all the failures, all the missed opportunities to give him praise and thanks, all the times where you go back on that guilt and you try to fix it and you reconcile it and you, you think that by living and doing and being, you're going to make the judge change his mind. Guess what? You can't. The judge already made up his mind. He already declared you victorious through Christ's resurrection. That's the victory that you and I live in. Amen. Please rise. Now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. I invite you to turn in your as we join together in confessing our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Reminder, our offering, uh, opportunity to give an offering are located at our various entrances within the sanctuary. We now respond with hymn 148 in the red hymnal, The Strife is O'er, The Battle Done.
Please stand. We join together in the response of prayer for Easter as printed in your service folder. We pray. Heavenly Father, God of grace, you have brought us into a new and living hope by the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. He was delivered over to death for our sins and raised to life for our justification. We marvel at the love you showed by your willingness to sacrifice your son to pay for our sins. We bow down in adoration at your mighty power, which raised him from the dead. Lord Jesus, God of grace, you filled our hearts with resurrection joy by your victory over sin, death, and the grave. With the church of every age, we offer you unending praise, for you have crushed Satan's head and have removed our guilt. Dear Savior, we who are weary and burdened come to you for rest, knowing that because of your perfect redemption, there is now no condemnation for us. Take away our doubts and fears and daily renew us the joy of your salvation. Holy Spirit, God of grace, you have called us by the gospel and brought us into saving faith in our risen Lord. Keep us with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. He is risen. As we journey through life, make us yearn for the day when you will give eternal life to us and all believers in Christ. He is risen indeed. We ask you now to hear us, Lord. As, you, as we bring you our own private petitions. Work through us as we proclaim the saving message of the crucified and risen Jesus near and far so that many others may hear your call, obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus and join us before the throne of our God and of the Lamb. Alleluia. For our Lord God Almighty reigns. Alleluia. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated. We'll close with our final hymn. Please note the instructions once again.